Hi, welcome to episode six of The Focus. I'm Aldu Rol. And I'm Horia Slushansky. Welcome. So today uh, we are going to discuss balancing, optimizing utilization and optimized flow. And Horia is showing there on our galaxy view is that's one of the, uh, the key balances that we believe that you need to look for in, uh, in adaptive oversight. Now, if you scroll over to the polarity map, just to tell you what we're gonna be walking through is first of all, we are going to discuss why is this, why we think this is an important polarity to, to balance. Then secondly is uh, after that, we are gonna go into um, understanding a little bit more about the current struggle pattern. So that's the bottom left of the polarity map. We will then uh, look at going up to the top right there as to what's are the, what are the desired outcomes for uh, balancing this polarity. Then we'll look at what's the risks of overcorrecting when we do focus too much on optimizing flow. And then we'll go up to number four, what are the benefits to be retained when we look at a, the focus on utilization. We'll then look at what does a good look like? What does life look like when we've got balance between both utilization and flow that's optimized? And then at number six there, we'll go down and look at what are the potential fears that we have on both the downsides. We'll then look at some actions and skills we can have in order to keep uh, things above that line um, where we have, re have, have things in balance and what are the measurable warning signs or those early warning signs that we'll have that when we know to, that we can look, for, look out for when we notice one of the two slips back into old habits and practices um, inside your context. Now, looking at the uh, optimizing utilization and optimizing flow balance, we thought it good that we'll start off today with a little bit of a, a story. And this is something that happened to me in uh, the real world many years ago in a uh, contract that I was working for in the UK. I'm not gonna name any names with specific organization in mind, but the organization was a system integrator doing some delivery work for the UK government. And what actually happened was, is I got the contract and I turned up on day one and I had no computer ready to actually work on and deliver work onto the project. And neither did I have on week two and neither did I have on week three and week four and then eventually after six weeks, I actually got my computer. But during this time, um, just sitting at your desk and not having something to work on is a little bit of a boring endeavor. So I ended up walking around and speaking to people and meeting people in that's working on the project and just getting to know people a, a little bit. And then after about two weeks, uh, I had the manager call me in and have a talking to me. And basically the conversation went as follows. Um, why are you not working? And I was like, well, I don't have a computer, so I can't do the work. And the manager said, well, you must be at your desk then I know you're working. It's like, but I don't have a computer. I can't do the work. And they went, no, you better stay at your desk because then I know you're working. Now, that sounds pretty absurd, but this is the honest truth that's happened to me. And you could have just blew, blow me over. I would have just, I could not believe I was having such an absurd conversation. But it's actually rooted in some form of uh, truth of what we're going to be discussing today. And with that as an introduction, it serves to show why this polarity is important. Horia, so I'm going to ask you to put on your uh, analysis cap and 
talk a little bit about what went on behind the scenes. Why was I being ad ad admonished for not sitting at my desk, even though I was not working? Well, Aldo, I'm not sure I can do justice to that uh, <laughs> <laughs> to that answer. Uh, what I will, however, say is uh, here's why we think um, the balance between optimizing utilization and flow is so important when considering oversight. Uh, too often in modern organizations, we seem to have an epidemic of efficiency. Everybody wants to be efficient. You don't want to waste anything, do you? So when you're so laser focused on efficiency, it's so easy to forget some pretty important things. So in Aldo's example, um, you need to show that you're working. You need to be utilized, right? You need to be there at your desk so we can be seen to be utilized. We've maximized utilization because the more you're utilized, the more you actually get what? Well, the hope is that the more you get utilized, the more you can actually contribute to deliver value. But what happened if you can't actually contribute to flow because you don't have the necessary material to, to make your contribution? So yes, you're feel, fully utilized at that physical location, but you can't actually contribute to flow. So therefore, we're not getting any contribution out of you, despite the fact of you being 100% utilized at that desk. So that absurdity is no good, yeah? Now, we often forget or get confused about efficiency and effectiveness. The point here is you cannot be efficient unless you are at first effective. In other words, if you're achieving something valuable, you can be said to be effective. Ah, once you are effective, then you can start considering efficiency. Because otherwise, attempting to improve efficiency at something that we're not effective at is a little bit useless. We need to have some basic level of effectiveness. Then, once we are effective, then we can improve our efficiency. So, uh, fortunately, we don't have to invent from scratch a whole way of dealing with how do we improve the flow of value. There's a whole theory of it, it's called the theory of constraints. And that realm of thinking gives us a lot of insights as to how to become a lot more efficient at improving good flow of value, becoming really effective. And in the context of that effectiveness, balance just the right kind of efficiency such that we get really good flow of value. I think uh, uh, there's a, a talk that Henrik Knieber gave a few years ago at one of the Agile conferences in Europe, where actually he handed out Lego blocks, making this point about achieving flow versus being fully utilized. And you could see the chaos that, that, that developed in the people that actually had to do the work um, because they had to be utilized fully. And it ended up having no throughput back to the customer. No work was delivered to the customer. So um, if you do get to see that, it's a really great example of uh, comparing how efficiency uh, uh, and uh, uh, flow, uh, how it works and what's the type of balance that you require in order to um, achieve uh, a great throughput uh, of value to your customers. Um, so with that as well is that's why we 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 selected this polarity as something that we've noticed and especially with the the, the panels from across the world, uh, the, these these thinkers in the agile space uh, that we've worked with, it came through as one of the typical struggle patterns that you have when it comes to oversight. Um, so there's a struggle for dominance between these two, between utilization and flow uh, or effective utilization and flow in organizations. And this is a source of conflict that requires a little bit of deeper understanding in your organization. Um, and we'll explore next about what will it take to achieve balance between these two. You can't just have the one without the other.
as Horia has explained. Now, without further ado, Horia, I'm going to get you to start us off on the current struggle patterns. Right. So this essentially says, what's the difficulty when we are emphasizing utilization too much? When we're saying we must have much utilization? Well, um, we have a lot of misconceptions. Um, we're, we're hoping for, for really good stuff, but we're getting really bad results. Particularly, what happens is if I'm focusing only on a local area, this particular small team, and we're saying, we're going to be fantastic, we're going to make oodles of gizmos, but we forget what the global contribution is, we may actually, despite our best intentions, we may actually de-optimize globally in the pursuit of local optima. So when our attention is captured in a local concern without considering our overall contribution, we may have some, some difficulty. Uh, often we see overbearing bureaucracy where the rule must be followed. Aldo just explained to you how well the rule is, you must be at your desk no matter what. Yeah, because then if you're at your desk, hey, at least whew, I know you, you're supposed to be delivering value somehow. Yeah, you're, you're, if you're at your desk, you're, you're in control, you're good. Never mind the fact that, oh, actually, by learning about the other teammates and understanding the bigger value stream, you actually using your Slack time really effectively. And Slack time is not criticism. Slack time is actually a very useful time. It's that time where you can actually invest in learning more about the broad organization, imagining new and better ways of doing things. Slack time is essential in improving organizations. But that requires clever clever thinking that is almost opposed to this overbearing bureaucracy. Now, there's another challenge uh, when people are so engrossed in utilization, and that is, I must have good news all the time. See, our utilization is really, really high. Um, our, our trends are uh, going in the right direction. Um, you may have heard us talk about the watermelon effect um, in earlier sessions where we have a project, look, it's green, it's green, it's green, oops, it's red. Um, the challenge there is if things are not going so flash, but we have the feeling of we must report um, always um, shining success, we're not actually being truthful to what is. Um, I've seen also uh, bastardizations of the re red, amber, green um, format where people come up with creative new colors like light green. It's like, hold on a second. Um, why light green? Uh, isn't there amber? Don't you have amber? Why does it have to be light green? <laughs> She's like, come on. <laughs> it's, uh, and I've literally heard the chief executive say, no, 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 you, you must uh, only show me green in your uh, report. So then uh, the various general managers of the various units, what will they do? Well, if the chief executive demands it, fine. We're going to go and sort of, you know how it is with the brown smelly stuff, it rolls downhill. Um, so uh, that kind of, of attitude is completely um, anathema to actually achieving great results. As an example of how to do it uh, exactly the opposite way, look, for instance, at the story of Ford Motor Corporation and how it has a successful turnaround where uh, Alan Mulally, it took him six months to get his senior executives to actually start reporting something other than green on their dashboards. And so the first time somebody admitted to, you know what, this is gonna be red and we're gonna make it. The first time that happened, he actually stood up and applauded. So when that executive saw that, oh, actually I'm not getting fired for this. The first thing Alan says is, okay, ladies and gentlemen, now finally we have this. How do we help this guy? Yeah. Um, that was enormously um, liberating for everybody. And all of a sudden, then uh, the floodgates opened and people started acknowledging and being truthful as to what has actually happened. Um, and as a result, Ford Motor Company did not uh, go bankrupt uh, like the other 
um, US uh, automobile manufacturers. So um, mistakes is another kind of huge area of, of struggle when we're so focused on utilization. Because if I'm uh, focusing on being utilized, 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 then I'm getting confused. I'm getting uh, so focused on um, multitasking between various things. It's very, very easy to be utilized all the time. Because I can pick 57 things and I keep switching between the 57 things and I'm always busy. I'm not achieving anything because I'm not completing anything, but I'm really busy. And not only I'm busy because I'm switching from this to that, from this to that, from this to that, my mental model of what I'm supposed to be doing always is in, in struggle. Because I was doing this thing and I was thinking about the various things that you're doing for this thing. And then I'm switching to a different thing and I have to forget all the context of that and remember all the context of this and as we humans are frail and our memory is shoddy at the best of times we are prone to forget and confuse things and mistake things and i'm doing this as if i was doing that and i get a completely different result so mistakes are a natural byproduct of being excessively utilized now don't get me wrong we're not suggesting that utilization should be ignored or not being invested in effectively. We're just saying don't overdo it. And when you do, you might get mistakes. You might also get overburdened. Yeah. Um, you might say, oh, look at us. We have this many gazillions of things to do. You almost, it's like a badge of honor. You ask people um, and you say, how are you doing? And more often than not, people will say busy as if that's a sign of a good thing. Yeah? It's not. Just being busy is not. As busy is how about you, but effective is how about the people that you serve? How satisfied are they? How much pride do you take in what you're bringing to others? So this overburden is, again, um, an unnecessary struggle of being too utilized. And finally, timing. Right? I alluded earlier to that idea of slack time. When you're so busy, and we allow ourselves to be starved for time, and you say to yourself, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time, I'm too busy. Then when are you actually going to make the time to invest in yourself? When are you going to make the time and get yourself better, get your team better, get your department better, get the whole organization better? When are we doing things that aren't just the red work of keeping things going and deliver, 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 deliver? When are we doing the blue work of thinking about how do we become better? When are we doing that work, which improves our way of work, not just the routine of delivering the work? So when we succumb to the tyranny of the urgent, we're having, again, a big struggle of being too intensely utilized. I'm pretty, so sure, I'm pretty sure there's quite a lot of, uh, of our viewers that will be able to uh, identify some of these uh, manifestations of these struggle patterns you've, you've uh, uh, just explained. Just stepping back a little bit about the red work and blue work, um, that's something that David Mulcahy in, in, his, in his writings um, talk about is having a balance between doing enough thinking um, and balancing that with the, with the doing work. Um, too much of one uh, is not good and too little of, of, of it is also not good. Um, so you need to find a balance between rate work and blue word or rate, rate, rate thing, uh, yeah, rate work and blue work. Um, thank you, Horia. Sorry, I fell into your uh, sentence there. <laughs> no worries. I was just uh, going to, to hand over to you to tell us about the <clears throat> desired outcomes of improved flow. Just uh, before I jump into that, um, there were so many examples from what you've explained of these struggle patterns that I was recalling from my work, from my work history. I wanted to jump in a few times there, but I'm pretty sure we'll we'll, we'll get to uh, we'll, we'll get to that someday. Uh, talking about 
about the the over focus on uh, uh, optimizing utilization. Yeah. As a reminder for our listeners, um, what we're doing with these sessions, they are just an overall light introduction to the general topic and subsequent series will delve into specific detail and examples and stories. And we're gonna have people that we're gonna interview about exactly that, see war stories from uh, people all over the world uh, in dealing with various aspects that have such a bearing on oversight. Looking at the upside of uh, having a focus on uh, balance, uh, on, on really having uh, great flow, um, optimizing, util uh, optimizing the flow. Um, one of the things that we picked up from the, the panels that we interviewed and also from our own experiences was there is that sense of joyful work. There's that sense of community that we've picked up uh, among the teams everybody was able to tell and know and articulate exactly what value they're delivering to the end customer. Um, and they were really, really attuned to that end result of whether the customer is actually happy with delivered value to that customer or not. Coupled with that is um, when you have the ability to, to optimize flow, you have the ability to quickly repurpose. You don't have um, people or uh, parts of the organization so entrenched that you cannot actually repurpose part of the service or part of the product that you're delivering. Um, so you, you, uh, um, you have broader skills bases in a flow-based environment and you can actually quickly pivot uh, and repurpose products and services as the, the needs and the wants of your customer base changes or part of your operating environment, the macro environment changes. Focusing on flow also gives you a really good return on investment uh, in terms of value for uh, the, inst the inputs. So um, what we can see there is, is that um, you, you see the value of continuously upskilling people in a flow-based environment. People understand how the overall picture works and that helps them, it gives them the ability to actually, um, uh, you get quite a good return on investment on the learning that they've been doing. And it's another form of waste reduction. Just have a look at all the theory um, and the examples from the, uh, the theory of constraints, um, there's quite a lot of ways in which you can actually reduce waste. And these are, so good return on investment is when you, uh, on optimizing flow is one of the things to look out for. Flex of utilization, and that's very closely related to the repurposing that we've talked about, but you'll see people are actually, or the organization is a lot more adaptable, they're flexible, they're a lot more focused on servicing and a lot more react, a quick, can react quite a lot quicker in changing conditions uh, or customer needs, et cetera. You'll also know that the measurements are different. Um, in a focus on, on flow utilization or uh, optimizing flow. Um, and some of the measures there is so you, what we've seen is there's a, a calling, especially if you've been looking up on LinkedIn over the last number of months, is people are asking the, uh, about the value of timesheets. So we're measuring things differently. Um, like we probably want to understand how many customers have we actually have a happy score as opposed to how many hours have you spent behind your desk twiddling your thumbs. So um, measurements are, are also totally different and it actually moves us a little bit away from vanity metrics. You still run the risk of some vanity metrics, but it moves us slightly away from um, that vanity metrics that Horia explained in the previous <laughs> panel. The other thing is, is that um, we also notice a bigger awareness of the value um, that's delivered. It's also the value that my work contributes to the wider picture that I'm working in. It's also I know exactly what my value has delivered or what my inputs have delivered in terms of value to an end customer 
or to the bigger picture overall. Um, it's also more visible, that value, um, and that helps, uh, and that brings around a whole different mindset around how we used to do things. We have a bigger um, awareness of where I'm sitting in a value stream. I know that somebody else up in the value stream, the, something they do will affect me, which can then have an effect downstream from where I sit. Now, the best people to actually realize that the quickest are in the software world are the testing people. They can immediately see the um, trouble he heading their way when some, some, something happens up front in, in a project. And those are really a, a, good, a good source of what is it that can go wrong in our project? How do we, or on our product? Those are really a good source. Other aspects of um, mindset is that we understand innately that we work in a complex adaptive uh, context. It's never linear. It's never just a one dimensional um, uh, thing. And with that comes the ability to continuously unlearn, learn and relearn things. Um, so mindset has got quite a lot of aspects to that as well. We also notice that when we have a really efficient uh, flow, there's also flexibility in the utilization of, uh, the, of this, the, the processes of the actual tools, our working tools, as well as the people that, uh, that, that delivers or contributes to value in, in, that, uh, in that context. Um, so you've got things like adaptive capacity management that we that we noticed that flex that uh, Horia spoke about also allows people to step away and take a look at the bigger picture when it's needed. That's really a valuable skill to have. And also we have flexibility in scaling up and down as demand changes in um, in 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 an organization. And then lastly what it is, is that it gives us the ability to actually have a longer term vision or a focus on the longer term value that we provide. We may be providing a product uh, at this moment in time, but we do have a real understanding that that product may become obsolete at some time in the future. This happens a lot faster in the software industry or in even just mobile apps, whatever the flavor of the week is. But you'll notice in um, you, you'll notice that awareness that exists about this product is going to have an end of life. What is the next thing that we can do to enhance that product um, or repurpose aspects of that product going forward? Now, it's not all just uh, dancing fairies and honey pots. Uh, there's also a downside if we overfocus onto uh, the uh, optimized flow. And this mm -hmm. is what Horia would actually jump into for us. That's right. So when we focus on flow a little bit too much and we're just interested in how do we flow things better without keeping an eye on utilization, we may have some troubles around utilization. We may actually become wasteful in manners that are avoidable. Um, so for instance, we say being blind to the tact time. What this actually means, uh, the tact time is the rhythm of the most constrained process step in the organization. Uh, with that most constrained process step, um, maybe it takes the longest, right? Let's say we can only produce one gizmo every day, right? So therefore, if I have a process step before that that produces three gizmos a day, then I only need to run that process every three days. Because I made three units, three days, the next process step can only do one a day. So therefore, I don't need much more. I don't need to have a, a huge... Uh, pile in front of that most um, sluggish step. So if we're blind to the 
tack time, if we don't pay attention to what the tack time is in our organization, we may have some, some difficulties, right? So our flow is going to, um, uh, to suffer. And if we're obsessed with flow too much, we may get some trouble in utilization. Um, we may end up with long lead times, long cycle times, uh, flow uh, also being too fast to get feedback. Things flow so rapidly. It's like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Uh, we've made too many things and we forget that um, something there may not be quite right. So therefore, we've created a lot of waste by flowing too much, right? Hey, because we got to flow. No, 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 no. We don't necessarily have to flow. We need to be mindful of how much flow is, is enough. We might also then have all sorts of dangers of, of friction. Um, if we, if we value, value how busy we are versus how wise and how uh, masterful we are, how um, skillful uh, craftsmanship, right? Um, not keeping uh, a sufficiently insightful systemic view, right? Understanding the whole ecosystem sufficiently well. Again, um, that uh, may give us challenge. Um, when we let go of workers that apparently aren't busy enough, but they're tremendously skilled and their very high skill isn't needed all the time, but when it is needed, whoa, does it save the bacon? Right, so really understanding that that person, just because they're not busy, doesn't mean they're not valuable. It means you need to be more curious, be um, better understanding what people's contributions actually are. We might have challenges of data, right? When I'm a, a slave to the data, I have a, a data tsunami, right? Too much data overwhelming me. Um, if I'm data-driven rather than data-guided, then I may be in trouble. Again, because I'm paying attention in a manner that's too constrained, too regimented. And that is similar to this whole local optomania. I'm manic about becoming efficient, uh, but I'm paying attention only locally. I'm losing sight of the actual overall purpose. If I say everything's got to flow, yeah, but in what context and what's the overall flow that we're trying to, um, to achieve? Um, we talk about uncertainty as well. Um, if we say chase the shiny little thing, hey, the, um, that's, a, that's easy to do, right? Um, let's have some, uh, some low, low hanging fruit uh, dealt with first, don't we? Well, yeah. Or, um, hey, this new technique, this new framework is fantastic. Let's just get on the bandwagon with that one. Yeah, but how is that actually going to help? Just chasing the shiny um, thing in the hope that it might be useful needs to be tempered with some proof. Notice that it actually works and get some actual um, results and figure out how to get through the discomfort of uh, trying something new, right? So again, needs balance. And finally, <clears throat> some of the difficulties with overemphasis on flow uh, are the um, <clears throat> adverse effects that this may have on people in terms of forgetting the customer or exhaustion or people saying, well, that's not my job. I'm uh, doing this over here, right? So understanding how people contribute and, and connect together to achieve great results. Well, that's really essential to balancing utilization with flow. So Aldo, tell us about some of the benefits we want to retain. Before we do that, I like the word local optomania. It's not, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, something I've definitely seen in my career. And uh, for our viewers, um, I'm pretty sure you may actually go and find examples of how that works in your context. 
Um, when we look at uh, the upside, the benefits that we can look at from focusing on optimizing utilization, um, just a few things come to mind here. Um, the first one is, is there's a clear grasp. It gives us a way of understanding the current level of productivity. Um, and that helps us to give a better view of the whole system that we're working in. It is support systems thinking. When we have a better view of productivity, it helps us also indirectly with motivation because we can now actually scale the right amount of work to people's actual capacity. And we notice, or we have talked about tired people, and we notice that if you've actually got the, uh, the, the, the work assignment to the capacity sorted, um, it does contribute to motivation and you don't get people that's overburdened or tired. There's also lots of satisfaction um, that you can actually notice um, uh, in terms of direct customer satisfaction. Hey, you guys did a really great job for us. Thank you, you helped us uh, in our organization or your product did this for us. So that is really visible and um, it, it, it does contribute to, to something like satisfaction. And also um, helping confidence um, when you make decision making, uh, when you're in decision making. Um, that's really a great sense of satisfaction and achievement. So Horia spoke about in the beginning about why we chose this. We talked about efficiency and effectiveness, and it does support greater efficiency in the organization if you get it right. Um, and this will help you if you have the right way to measure it uh, you you find that sweet spot um, of your of optimal trade-offs. You'll know what are the key trade-offs that you have, and you have an optimum in which you perform those trade-offs. And then, lastly, there is a great uh, contributor. It is a great contributor to to customer empathy, and you're more open to co-create and collaborate with your customers than to just dumping uh, things on the on the desk or just give them something and forget about it. Um, it is about um, the, the age of co-creation and collaboration. Um, so having a good utilization or effective utilization or optimized utilization, you also have greater customer empathy. Now let's look at the upside of having balance between the um, optimization and flow. Um, when we've got optimized utilization and optimized flow, uh, what is the overall aspiration or the value we get out of having that in balance? Oh, yeah. Well, the promise is that I want to have a really good flow of value. In other words, our community is serving its stakeholders really, really well. We're flowing value really, really well. But we're not just having a good flow of value and being well, engulfed in a sense of uh, not sure if we're actually efficient as well, because we don't really want to be wasteful. So we have a sense of achievement, of contribution, and a sense of mastery, a sense of competence, a sense of, yeah, we're doing this really well. We're really elegant and efficient, we are practicing with, with simplicity. So seeing people really generating delight in our customers, enjoying our work and having a, a joyful workforce, um, noticing from the perspective of people engaged in oversight that we're actually impactful. The things that we're doing in how we're guiding our teams, our communities are really useful in avoiding waste, in avoiding obstacles that are um, and that can be anticipated, um, being able to pivot well when we hit an obstacle that we couldn't anticipate. Um, when surprises happen, we need to have the ability to, to respond well to what is going on. So responsiveness is another um, category that is really 
uh, part and parcel of this really great balance of optimization and flow. And finally, in a nutshell, we want to have good business. We want things to be really giving us a good return. We want to have just enough effort, just in time to deliver a really great result. Because we're not seeking profit for the sake of profit. We're seeking profit such that we can invest in getting better. We have enough of a spare capacity that we can actually invest it in getting better. We can invest it in developing new skills, developing new abilities, being more socially responsible. If we have the good fortune of running a really great organization that commands good um, renowned and appreciation in the market, then it's also our responsibility to be kind and mindful of the community and the society around us. And we must uh, pay back the, the good social and economic conditions that made it possible for us to be successful and therefore contribute to their support. Before you move on, Aurea, so one of the things that I'm noticed there that impactful oversight is that um, if you have, want to start somewhere in your organization with uh, the adaptive oversight journey and approach, um, this may be one of the easier places to start in your organization because there's enough uh, tips, tools, techniques, methods, and practices out there that can actually help you get on the right track with adaptive oversight um, from the schools of theory of constraints, agility, as well as more traditional um, uh, ways of working uh, out there. And what you just got to do is to be able to find the right balance for your context over here, Aurea. Mm. Yeah, well, um, now you can tell us, uh, Aldo, about uh, what are the, the things we're avoiding? What are we running away from? Okay, so when we have the downside of both, so all both are happening and we've got massive conflict between the two schools of thought, um, the first thing that we'll notice is inefficiency. In other words, the work slow, this work slows down. You see very little customer value delivered. Um, and you'll, 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 you'll also notice by the amount of noise that, that's coming from customers, um, reviews can be pretty bad. So look out for those, those types of things. The other thing that um, we notice is there's an increase in bureaucracy uh, because both sides would try and uh, stabilize the situation. Suddenly you'll notice that there's suddenly more rules than you had before. Um, so you'll see all sorts of attitudes and behaviors when it comes uh, to bureaucracy. Um, when we talked about inefficiency, I did mention about blocked flow, and you'll, you'll notice quite a lot of those types of things that, you, that people are trying to avoid, and their behaviors would all be about trying to avoid things. Look out for no new learning that's happening. Look out for slack, lack of slack in people's schedules, um, uh, etc. You also notice um, some things that uh, people or parts of the organization try to avoid. So there's lots of avoidance type strategies or behaviors, and you'll see reality really being distorted. I think I like the example that Aurea used about the green and the light green <laughs> statuses of your rag, of your red amber green report. This is just an, an example of actually avoiding the truth. Um, you also see uh, the stress that you'll notice the stress and you'll notice how harmful the stress will be, not just in the workplace, but also in people's personal lives. And that's, again, too much uh, overburdening of stress that brings their people will, having, will be having marital issues or broken families. That could be quite an extreme case of uh, the situation of the utilization flow not being fully in balance. Speaking of balances, you also notice quite a lot of work imbalances. 
you'll have two people sitting right next to one another. The one would be overworked and the other one next to that person would twiddle their thumbs and have very little to do. You'll see death march projects and um, you will also notice an uptick of unplanned work. Um, so that's also something that uh, you can find when we have got the downside of both utilization and flow um, not being optimized. And then safety is one of the first things that would fly out of the window. You'll see blame storming. You'll uh, see people, uh, executive decision makers, uh, doing everything in their power not to go to jail if something goes. Um, so they want to avoid to go to jail. Um, that's, the, that's the biggest fear that any executive have when they look at having to balance optimized utilization and optimized flow. I've already mentioned a little bit of things to look out for, but before we do that, and um, let's get Aurea to talk about some of the actions and skills that we can have to or implement to maintain a balance between utilization and flow in your context. Mm. So developing a good measurement system is a really effective starting point. In other words, if we truthfully notice what is actually happening and we have a dashboard that is meaningful humans have a relatively limited attention span we cannot pay attention to millions of things all at the same time we barely manage to keep track of just over a handful of items think for instance in a car these days, there are lots of computers. There are lots of sensors. There are lots of data streams. But what the driver pays attention to is just a tiny, tiny number of metrics. I'm interested in how fast are, are we going? So I'm going to have a speedo, right? If it's an internal combustion engine, it'll be useful to know how quickly is the shaft turning, right? How many revs does the engine have? Because that'll give me an idea of what's, what's going on from a power perspective. And it'll be different between petrol and diesel and so on. Um, I might want to know a little bit about the oil, a little bit about the coolant, and I'm good. Yeah. So a small number of metrics forms a measurement system that's sufficient to know, yep, everything is going well. Optimizing our rules to the actual way of work. In other words, if I have to do some work and this work requires us to create a new product and this new product has a new range of skills that are required to deliver this product, then the rules that we used to have previously for our different products that require different sets of skills, they might not fit. And if I want to have really good results with this new product as well, then I can't insist in our organization, this is how it's always done, because, hey, these other five products has been very successful. There's other rules. We have to have the same rule for this. Well, why? There's no good reason for standardization for the sake of standardization. Now, that's not to say that standardization is useless. On the contrary, discipline sets us free. Standardization is really, really useful. But optimizing what kind of standards are we using in what context and what kind of rules do we use in what areas of our work, that's really, really important. Now, the next area we talk about vital engagement. And we use the idea of vital engagement, it's a concept of a flourishing. People are seeing their life getting better and they're engaged in that work. Now that requires us to create conditions for really good connection. Getting good at dynamic reteaming, meaning if 
the nature of what we do has to change, then we maybe need to change the way that we're structured in teams. Um, <clears throat> often in recent years, <clears throat> we've seen the necessity to change teams every few months or even sometimes every few weeks. We need to readjust a new team for a new initiative for a new activity. So making it possible for people to actually want to engage in this kind of uh, reteaming, that's essential and that requires cultivating vital engagement. Understanding the theory of constraints and what it brings, um, the ideas of drum buffer rope, uh, the A3 management process, there are really effective mechanisms and tools for improving flow and understanding what's standing in the way of flow. What should we be changing and why? Um, the idea of drum buffer rope, for instance, um, the drum, you can think of it, the concept of the drum is boom, 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 boom. It's that rhythm of what's the slowest step in our process? Because the drum is the place where we should be focusing making sure that the drum never runs out of stuff to process and it's not overburdened with too much stuff to process, right? Now the buffers are the supply elements upstream of the drum <clears throat> that need to have just enough material just in time such that the flow can happen. And the ropes are signals to the various buffers to make sure that the drum is well satisfied with material. So understanding things like this, noticing them, playing with them in the world of work is really, really useful. Uh, another uh, idea there, uh, andon for learning. Andon is another um, Japanese term um, from the lean community. It literally means lantern or light or indicator. Um, <clears throat> So what might happen in a production line is you'll have an indicator uh, up on the ceiling and there's a little rope um, next to your workstation. And if you're struggling to accomplish what you need to accomplish in the period of time that you're, you have allotted for it, you're gonna pull the rope and the line's gonna stop and the indicator is gonna light up. And that is an opportunity for everybody. Okay, you kind of look up and say, ah, it's over there. You go and literally stop your work as well. And you go and notice what's happening and you offer insight and you use the undone process of stopping the line as an opportunity, not for making fun of the person saying, ha ha, what an idiot you are. You didn't finish your job in the time you had allotted. Instead, you find out what went wrong and why and how can we prevent that from happening again? And how do we teach people? What do they need to do differently such that that doesn't happen again. And in this way, you achieve far better insight, you achieve far better skill, far better quality, and overall a far better flow of high quality products and far better value to the actual end customers. Contrast this with what was happening in the early days of um, automobile manufacturing, where literally things wouldn't quite fit and one of the, the last steps in the production line were literally people with hammers hammering things in so that they can actually kind of fit together at the very end. Yeah, so the tolerances were, were so, so poor, right? Now, another area of skill is the visualization of the whole value network and related to that, the understanding of value networks. Now, this might be a little bit tricky to, to wrap our minds around because whenever we say value stream, we think of one flow of activity that delivers value for a particular product or service line. And this value stream is very much like a tributary of contributions that result in the delivery of that value. Now, most medium to large organizations these days do not produce a single value stream. They tend to have multiple contributions that are overlapped. So in other words, I don't just have one value stream. I don't have the luxury of a one product. I have a whole heap of products that are flowing 
in parallel all at the same time. So I don't really have just a value stream. I have a value network of a whole range of value streams happening all at the same time. So if you think about it, if I say um, a value stream, let's say, occupies one floor of a high-rise building, and I have another value stream on the second floor and another value stream on the third floor and so on. Now, some people will actually contribute to multiple floors. It's as if their office has like a fireman's pole where they have to go between floors to contribute to the various value streams. So things get really, really tricky really, really quickly. I'll do. Another example there is to go and observe how actually uh, a day-to-day, -day, a full day work in a Subway outlet. Um, Subway, uh, you know, the, the, the sandwich makers, each piece of um, uh, filling that needs to go onto the bread have its own set of conditions that needs to be met. It needs to be kept at certain temperatures, etc. So if you go have a look at even just the complexity of what needs to happen before those become uh, be, are placed in the, um, uh, the display cabinet before the sandwich get made, gets made. It's quite fascinating to look at how that works as a value network, just as something as simple as a subway outlet. Mm. So a significant challenge here is conceptualizing and noticing, paying attention to a value network because it's so intricate, it's so complex. So learning how to visualize the whole value network, all of this collection of value streams is tremendously important for understanding where are we sufficiently utilized? Where are we pushing too much? We're, we're pushing into overutilization and therefore diminishing flow. So there's lots of techniques, lots of approaches to understand the network and then understand the capacity of the network. And then a technique, for instance, here that comes to mind is this idea of planning to capacity, understanding your actual capacity. So for instance, uh, many of us will have seen the following pattern in organizations that use the Scrum framework. So a scrum essentially says we will have a sprint. It's a period of time, let's say a couple of weeks. And in that sprint, in those two weeks, we will uh, create uh, a number of items from our product backlog. So our product backlog has, let's say, quite a lot of items. And we need to understand what is our capacity, right? Now, one technique that many teams use is this idea of using story points. Um, the concept is that every item in the product backlog gets accorded a score in story points. And therefore, one item might be three story points, one item might be two story points, one item might be five story points, one item might be one story point. And then at the end of the sprint, we count up which items do we get completed? Okay, we got three items completed. Every single item was two story points. Therefore, two plus two plus two, that makes six story points. Okay, cool. So that essentially says in this sprint, we accomplished six story points. Now, that essentially tells us our capacity for a usual sprint is about six story points. Now, what usually happens, and you, you might have seen this before, is people notice our capacity is six story points. And what do they do? They say to themselves, oh, no, 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 no. We will be so much more efficient next sprint. We will be so much better. Let's plan for 12. And what actually happens is, again, they deliver about six. And it's as if we're affected by amnesia. And we forget completely that, okay, we just fail and we only accomplish six. And we say to ourselves again, no, 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 no. It was a fluke. Let's do it again. Let's aim for 12 again. And we all do again about five to six. So when we're not planning to capacity, when we're lying to ourselves, we're actually harming ourselves. So that's really, really important plan to capacity and then deliver to that capacity. And if you have finished the six sooner, fine, grab some more and deliver a bit more. And that's how you might improve.
Now, queuing theory is another area of mathematics that is very useful in improving this balance of flow with utilization. Uh, work in process, time in process, understanding throughput, and something called um, Little's law that gives us uh, the connection between utilization and um, work and process. Understanding um, uh, this and then relating it to what's important. So for instance, this idea of the paint drip or broken comb. Uh, what that means is rather than assuming that we must have individual specialists and everybody must be super specialized in one particular skill and one particular skill only, well, that has a significant difficulty associated with it. Because if we want to flow, then I can't afford to just wait for Johnny, the ultra specialist, because then everybody has to wait on Johnny. And the more um, limitations like that we have, the more broken our flow is going to be. So instead of that, what I want to have is I want to have a range of skills such that for the things that need doing, many or most of us can actually pick up the piece of, of work and get it done. So uh, a paint drip, right? If I have a brush and I cut across the wall and it drips to different levels, that essentially uh, is a metaphor for how rather than thinking I have only one depth of skill in one area, I actually have different depths of skills for different areas. So if I overlay the contributions of multiple people, we have a, a good depth of skill for all of the areas that we need. So that uh, then makes us able to manage our cues of work much more fluidly, much more effectively. We can improve our flow. And finally, uh, an absolutely essential skill set for balancing utilization with flow is leadership. Um, flowing leadership where needed. Um, some um, schools of thought call this pushing authority to information. Others call it pulling authority to information. It's the same kind of result, but seen from a different perspective. This essentially means rather than me as a leader making decrees far away from the work um, itself, I'm actually going and seeing what is happening and I'm delegating the decision-making wisely in that locale. However, I cannot afford to divorce my responsibility for oversight. I still need to keep an eye on what's happening and notice are the people doing the work aware of all that they need to be aware of such that their contributions don't run afoul of things that they don't notice, right? Remember the second meaning of the word oversight. Whoops, we had an oversight. We didn't see something, yeah? So as a leader, you have to be able to, to manage this balance of um, enable people to go ahead and make impactful decisions and yet give them the right information, keep them aware of what they need to know in order to make sure we're not shooting ourselves in the foot. We're actually getting great results. So what are some of the warning signs, Aldo? Okay, so just latching on to where Horia ended with leadership. Uh, um, one of the things that you'll notice um, is incompetent leadership. You'll notice quite a lot of behaviors around incompetent leadership. Um, and there's things like um, zealotry. Um, there's a pretense of certainty. These leaders are really sure, uh, certain. So, And then when you scratch a little bit on the surface, there's, uh, it's actually got no um, roots or, or nothing concrete or substantial um, that it's rooted in. One of the things that um, was quite an eye opener for me when um, I started immersing myself into coaching as well as the work from David Mulcahy is the awareness of language. And you can pick up quite a lot of uh, hints or ideas or um, signs of what the prevailing culture in an organization is when you listen to the language that people are using, especially decision makers. 
and it gives more away than you think about what is going on there. So some of the warning signs that we use in order to pick up what is going on is the listening to the prevailing language in the organization. You'll see pure, uh, uh, pretty poor framing of ideas or problems or, or things. There's that busyness uh, that Horia spoke about earlier. Um, there's excuses. There's the, um, I don't have time for this type, uh, type of, uh, uh, on, if you wanna try something new is I don't have time. So the language gives quite a lot away. Horia spoke about measurement um, and one of the ways to actually, as a warning sign, is when, when you have measures in place, is to look at what, uh, what is the actual numbers in there. And these did give giveaways about poor flow. And poor flow throughput um, gives you quite a lot that you can work with in order to say, hang on a minute, something isn't right here. Let's stop and actually step back and look at what contributes to that poor flow. Other things that we've noticed is the um, myth that multitasking allows you to do more. Um, it's actually very ineffective. It gets you to do less. An organization I helped in Johannesburg many years ago, um, they have assigned one BA to six projects and nothing got ever done because it was always context switching for this poor BA. Um, he ended up booking uh, meeting rooms so that in, and having fake meetings so that nobody can book time with him so that he can actually go and sit in a meeting room and actually get some work done. It was really fascinating to see how this type of behavior was playing out in the organization. There is the, the typical word that we've, uh, that we, that we've come to uh, associate with dread is the bureaucracy. So look out for those uh, bureaucratic behaviors, the, the excessive rules that's in place in order to uh, help control things a little bit more. Bringing in more rules does not necessarily give you more control. Uh, so look out for uh, behaviors around bureaucracy. We spoke about burden and overburden, but one of the ways that we can actually look at that is by the overstress inside an organization. Again, this could be linked to listening to some of the language. Um, part of some of the language would be franticness. You'll sense there's a, sen a sense of franticness, and that's a sign of overstress uh, inside the organization. Um, You'll see uh, this one that says people or teams wearing metaphorical blinders and just it's just the over uh, stress that you have on people just shuts down parts of the brain um, and uh, doesn't release the resources as it's supposed to do. You also see things like missing, critical constraints that's missing. So for instance, an and on cord in a factory floor that may be missing, but a similar thing like Aurea explained, the and on cord, uh, a way of having an and on in a, a non, uh, a, no, a service organization is perhaps not anybody, uh, no, no possibility of giving feedback or raising a risk or raising issues of what's happening. That's another form of not having an end on. Uh, end on. That over-focus on um, local optimizations. Uh, we spoke about our local optima. Uh, that is really that over-focus. And it becomes a real political game. These local optima trying to fight one another and who loses at the end of the day? It's the customer. With that, values forgotten. Notice the behaviors about people forgetting value, um, forgetting the customer. There's lots of defects, there's lots of surprises, there's lots of frustration because people don't understand the value, they, they've forgotten the value. And then we, we had overstress and on the other side, we had no stress or understress. Um, you get a lot of gold plating happening. Instead of shipping something, people would just keep adding more um, 
value to a product that may not necessarily be utilized or used. Um, there's a fear of not uh, of doing nothing or having nothing to do. These are all aspects of under stress. Now, these are some of the warning signs that we've done and just summarizing it, if you just zoom out a little bit, Korea, this is what we think and what we have found when we have interviewed these number of people across the globe when it comes to optimizing utilization and optimizing flow and achieving a balance between those two for us. As usual, if you have some things, some stories, some war stories uh, to contribute, if we have missed anything on these eight panels, by all means, we would love to hear from you. Come talk to us, we'd love to interview you and actually build this out and even uh, if we just zoom in on one of these aspects, it's still valuable learning for all of us. That was optimizing utilization and balancing that with flow. Thank you, Aurel. Thank you, Aldo. And thank you um, to all our listeners for your patience. Um, we're getting on the home stretch. We have a few more of these to, to cover, and then we're going to get into interviews with practitioners from around the globe. See you soon. I'm Aldo Roll signing off for The Focus, and, and I'm Horias Boshansky. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.